One of the amusing but sad things about the population bomb was that it was much too optimistic a book. Think about the things that we didn't know about in 1968 when it was uh, published. For instance, Norman Myers hadn't discovered the threat to the tropical forests and to biodiversity in general at that time. Uh, we wrote about, in the population bomb, about the threat of novel diseases and massive epidemics, but AIDS itself hadn't appeared yet. Uh, we talked about uh, the issues of ecological issues related to nuclear war, but the nuclear winter studies hadn't been done at that time. Uh, again, it was clear to all scientists that human beings were going to change the climate, but at that time it wasn't certain whether the overall effect would be on global temperatures would be cooling or warming, because Ralph Cicerone and others hadn't discovered the other parts of the greenhouse forcing. At that time, we thought it was just an issue of carbon dioxide, didn't know about the, uh, the problems with methane and nitrous oxide and so on. The threat to the ozone layer hadn't been discovered at that time. So basically, the population bomb was a ridiculously optimistic book, but it was the only book covering those issues at that time. We'll try to put the world's environmental crisis in perspective. Our guide is Paul Ehrlich, the distinguished Stanford University biologist. And this morning he begins with the subject he is best known for, the population bomb. When I wrote the population bomb in 1968, three and a half billion people were crowded onto Earth. The great famines that have plagued Africa could only be imagined. Now, 20 years later, we add almost 90 million people a year to the planet. And despite some efforts, we're doomed to shoot past 6 billion in just 10 more years. 90% of the world's population growth this year will be in poor developing countries like India and Bangladesh. In some ways, the dominant animal is a, uh, an update on the population bomb issues, uh, all of which have changed somewhat since the population bomb was written. On the cheery side, uh, population growth has slowed in many areas, almost reversed in parts of Europe, and that's extremely cheery, uh, even though some people don't understand why it's cheery. Uh, the uh, issues of resource depletion have become much clearer to everybody and are covered there, and of course, we're in the middle of the second great resource war right, right now. The first great resource war was fought in 1967 over water between uh, the Arabs and the Israelis. And now, of course, we've invaded Iraq, the United States, uh, to try and get control of its petroleum. And we are organizing our military to fight the Chinese over the Caspian Basin, fossil fuels, and things like that. So that's something that we talk about quite a bit in The Dominant Animal. But it also has elements of uh, what uh, I wrote about in the book published by Island Press called Human Natures, and that is, where human beings came from. And the whole, whole purpose of the dominant animal uh, was to provide an overview of the things that every human being ought to know by the time they're an adult, that you can get all the way through major any major university without knowing. Uh, and that is where we came from, fundamentally, and what from our evolution tells us important things about our everyday activities now, and then where we're going. Domination of nature has become a religion with us. It traces all the way back to the agricultural revolution. Nowhere is the price we pay for that destruction more dearly felt than in the Amazon rainforest, where thousands of square miles of tropical jungles are being burned to make way for cattle ranches and farms. In the meantime, thousands of species and millions of populations of other organisms go extinct. The critical juncture, though, was the development of a massive culture by human beings. That is, culture is the non-genetic information that people have. And that's what's allowed us to become uh, the dominant animal on the planet. So the issues we face now are how do we direct our cultural evolution to keep the dominant animal from sawing off the limits sitting on, for destroying civilization, for after all, for the first time, in the history of humanity, we've had many civilizations fail and collapse with terrible consequences for the people, but they've always been local or regional. Now, for the first time, we have a global civilization that's teetering on the brink of collapse. Uh, and the only way we can really uh, cure that is by changing 
our cultural evolution by changing the way human beings behave. And a short list of some of the things we should be doing is paying as much attention to births as we pay to deaths. Everybody is very interested in delaying death as much as possible. But if you intervene, as we have in the death rate artificially, and are keeping people alive longer, then it's ethically required that you also intervene in the birth rate. Otherwise, the population will continue growing until we have a collapse. So that's one thing. Another thing is to look very uh, closely at consumption uh, and worry about whether conservation is not equally important to consumption. Uh, where consumption is overconsumption, it should be reduced. Where it is underconsumption, as it is with at least a billion or maybe two billion very poor people on the planet, it should be increased. And that's a tough, challenging thing, but that's something we should be looking at our cultural evolution to deal with. Another thing connected with consumption uh, is we pay a lot of attention to what our technologies can do for people but we don't pay enough attention to what they do to people or to the people directly or to people's environments. Uh, toxic substances are a good example of this where we release all kinds of toxic materials into the environment uh, without paying enough attention to their terrible possible side effects. So we have to pay much more attention to how our technologies operate. Remember that uh, originally the freons, the chlorofluorocarbons, when they were invented by DuPont, seemed to be a miracle. They were a wonderful substitute for poisonous substances in refrigerators and so on, and uh, looked great. But it turned out that if we had continued manufacturing, we would have ended human life. Not a clever result. So you've got to be very careful. In other areas, like toxics, you can't be sure. We may be surprised any time and find out that it's a much more serious problem than, say, climate change. So the answer is we should have been working on all this stuff and we should prioritize all the big environmental issues, including avoiding nuclear war, way above the kind of things that are, for instance, talked about in current political campaigns and so on. In other words, whether the stock market's going up or going down, that's trivial crap compared to what's happening to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the number of people, uh, the hormone-mimicking chemicals that we're putting into our environment. Well, you know, one of the great reasons to work for Island Press is it's a wonderful group of people. Uh, that's a starter. Second thing is that they're the only press I know of that has a mission of trying to save the world, which is very, very important. Uh, and uh, they put out the best books on environmental issues that anybody puts out. So I'm a great fan of Island Press. And uh, got to remember that the threats to the globe uh, that we're facing today uh, are all in Island Press's uh, the major ones are all in Island Press's uh, area of concern because they're environmental. Even the threat of nuclear war is fundamentally also an environmental threat. So Island Press is one of the uh, part of the thin red line trying to stand between uh, civilization and its destruction.